Energy 808, the cutting edge. So pleased to be back with you all today. And I'm also so very, very pleased to have Brianna Sachs back with us again. She joined us a number of weeks ago, kind of in the throes of the Lahaina tragedy, and she was reporting, uh, reporting from on the ground there. So we get a chance again to talk one-on-one -on -one with Brianna of the Washington Post. And uh, thank you so very, very much, Brianna. I so appreciate you uh, joining me and joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me back. So let's let's just dive uh, right into it. I always like to ask uh, my guests kind of how how you came to to the place you are. What what your path was like since you're now reporting for to me one of the most uh, important, one of the most esteemed national publications in the United States, the Washington Post. And I'm I'm really be curious as to uh, how you came to where you are now. I I spent. I like kind of learned how to journalism at BuzzFeed News. I was there for almost seven years. I, in 2017, covered my first disaster, which was in the U.S. Virgin Islands after hurricanes Irma and Maria struck the region, and I really pushed to go. And I was able to finagle my way onto a uh, military in bed and probably, I think, was the first national reporter on the ground there. I had only been reporting for maybe six months and just had no idea what I was doing and showed up with some snacks and a flashlight. And uh, it was like a developing country at that point, you know, there's no water power, uh, tanks were everywhere. It was um, just a really devastating scene. And I was there for two weeks. And then I got back to LA where I was living and my editor was, said there was a fire up in Northern California, would you want to go cover it? And it was the Santa Rosa Tubbs fire, uh, which was another just mind blowing disaster because it had, we had not really seen a fire go into a community like that before back in 2017. So I turned around and went, flew up to Santa Rosa and I just kind of became the disaster reporter uh, among covering a lot of other things. And I was very passionate about it. So I just covered disasters, nearly everyone um, for BuzzFeed News. And then this job came about last June at the Washington Post for a disaster reporter. And I applied and I, I, I got it. Wow. So you've been with the Post a little more than a year. You started, you say, June of last year? No, I, less than a year. I started in November. That was like when the job application oh, okay. came out. So. Okay. So you responded to a job application. You applied and you got the job. Just kind of curious, was it a very rigorous or multi-interview kind of process you had to go through to actually get hired? Yes, very much so. Wow. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciated your reporting uh, from uh, various disaster areas. And, and I'm kind of curious, what is, the, uh, what is the fascination you have with the uh, with disaster reporting, clearly it's something that you're choosing to do, right? So what, what is it that, that, that floats that particular boat for you? I, I, I grew up evacuating wildfires. And I think for me, things turned in 2018 when a wildfire went through my own hometown. Um, I lost some of my own childhood memorabilia in that fire. And I was driving around reporting while also seeing my former high school classmates lose their homes and trying to get supplies into the area that had been cordoned off by authorities, very you know similar to kind of like what Lahaina went through in some way. So I, I'm a very empathetic person and, and just seeing the toll that disasters take on communities. And I very much realized early on that that toll is not equal that people who have less resources and who are already on the edge of trying just to get by really get the short end of the stick um, and aren't able to recover as quickly as those with money and resources. And I just want to continue to shed light on that. I think there's also a lot of accountability in disasters in terms of who's getting the money and, and why and what are like the governments could be doing better. And um, yeah, and, and then just the personal connection to it as well. From a human perspective, 
uh, since you mentioned that you, 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 you're an empathetic person and you're talking to people whose lives have been upended to say the least, if not really shattered by some type of disaster. Uh, how do you walk the particular line of being an empathetic human being and listening to people's stories and yet maintaining, uh, necessarily maintaining, I'd say some degree of objectivity to report the story? Um, I think it's just always being a human first. Like, yes, I'm a journalist, but also I, I can't help the way that I feel when I hear these, these stories. And I think just letting people know that there's someone that they can talk to oftentimes that's like very cathartic for them. And however I can do to help, like, yes, journalists are supposed to hold people to account, but it's also a service an act of service and if I can help them in some way that really motivates me and I think that comes with really understanding what they're going through and seeing it with my own eyes and hearing and validating their experience and I that um I would hope you know that I can continue to to do that and I don't know if it's about being ob objective or not but it's more that I can be a platform to get their voices out there and I, I assume you have a go bag, right? Because disasters can, <laughs> can happen from one moment to the next and you don't want to be thinking, what, what do you need to put in a suitcase? So probably have a bag ready to go at all times. I actually don't, which is hilarious. Um, I, I mean, I have like my thing, like we have our first aid kit and our gear and everything, but no, I don't have a bag pack to go at all times. Okay. Well, that's great. That's great. Uh, I, I so appreciate hearing your story, kind of how you came to be who you are now as far as reporting for, for the Washington Post. Thank you. Uh, well, getting into the Hawaii subject matter, there was an article today in the Honolulu Star Advertiser uh, regarding a, an interview that uh, a Hawaii PUC chair Leo Ascension gave that uh, I was kind of struck by, and uh, I sent it to you and a number of other people and I would like to ask uh, what kind of uh, response uh, or thoughts or commentary you you have on what you read uh, from from Leo in the piece. Yes, granted, I'm very much an outsider to Hawaii politics and governance and I'm not very familiar with the PUC. I've had to really do a lot of homework and research. Being from California, we're very different in how we handle, it seems, fire and the investigative process of, of that, especially when it seems, when it's deadly. But I was very surprised that the regulators in charge of this utility just are taking such a back seat in the investigative process and that it just seems to say that they don't really have the ability to you know, kind of, I think, what do what people expect them to be doing and that, like, they're kind of toothless and they don't, aren't capable of enforcing rules is kind of how I, how I read it. Um, I also have, like, a question about, like, you know, the, the statute that I think, you know, you and I talked about is especially in death that they're, um, they're supposed to be, in you know, in investigating the cause. So it, to me, it kind of adds it's just like another puzzling piece of like their response in general, at which they didn't really say anything until I think almost a month after the fire. Um, they've seemed to just really want to take a back seat here, uh, which is different than than how California Public Utility Commissioners oper have operated in the past. Yeah, I was struck along the same lines as well. And uh, Leo you know, specifically mentioned that they deal more with carrots rather than sticks. And that doesn't strike me as being all that uh, accurate in that uh, the commission has many uh, tools that it's uh, in its toolkit as far as being able to sanction and deal with the companies that are under its regulatory purview. So there's rather, well, rather yeah. Yeah, I think it's notable and I, um, you know, I checked with some former commissioners, but that they haven't investigated a fire be before, uh, which I was also kind of surprised by so I think you know this is like it seems like their first chance or experience doing so um so I don't know really if it's just a novice thing or um what well, again I, I I I have not done enough reporting like to really understand the inner workings of the 
commission. But California, we have our um, safety and enforcement division, and uh, they have levied pretty major fines, and they, you know, investigate alongside our, our fire investigators, our state investigators, and they publish these really lengthy reports. They've investigated every major wildfire in California, and like, you know, based on recommendations that uh, that division's recommendation, the PUC then will give utilities huge fines that have been like tens of millions of dollars per fire. Kind of as we, we as we move to uh, to the line of fire and the response of uh, or the the uh, liability of Hawaiian Electric and their their situation right now, uh, it, it's it's striking to me that I mean I I don't know I guess how long how much longer do you think it's going to take? Do you have a sense as far as um, uh, when the ATF is conducting an investigation? When typically is there a time frame or a time range when one can expect, when a member of the public can expect that the ATF will complete an investigation? Do you have any sense the, of that? No, I mean, I haven't been on a fire where the ATF has been lead investigator. That's yeah. incredibly rare. So they're, you know, usually brought in for uh, you know, shootings and, and, and things like that. So, no, I don't have a sense of, of that time. I know sometimes these things can take six months. Um, that's, but that has not been based on prior ATF investigation experience. I guess we're, we're, we're all in a wait and see mode here, certainly. Yeah. So you were one of the, uh, one of the reporters fairly early on the ground after the tragedy in Lahaina. And uh, you were, you know, leading the pack of a number of, uh, of media sources. And I really so appreciate your reporting. What what strikes you kind of with some retrospect now that it's like, you know, two months have gone by since the tragedy. What strikes you uh, from your reporting um, now that you, you have a couple of months of hindsight as far as what happened, why and the aftermath? I mean, it's just it's just gutting. I think uh, housing is, is just going to be it's like another community that was really already struggling with affordable, accessible housing and this tension between again those with resources and the tourism industry and the people who are supporting the, the tourism industry and how their you know life around them continues to get more expensive and what the loss of all this housing stock will mean where do you put people um the trickle down effect that has on people's mental health physical health emotional well-being their kids so there's there's all those factors and it's just like really incredibly hard and it's it's a really difficult puzzle to solve. And Maui in particular, I know historically, you know, the government's pretty, um, from, from what I've been told in, in, in my reporting, like hasn't really reached out for help from, from other islands. And so I think it seems it's having to really like kind of do a culture shift here and, and let other people and outsiders in to do their job, which I know it was reticent to do in the beginning of the fire. Um, so that that was a striking difference in in terms of like my experience with with disasters before was just that that um, that cultural um, you know that that attitude which is steeped in a lot of history that again I'm not very you know well versed in but I I think that, yeah the housing and insurance is going to be a really big problem the fact that this was a fire and then also a wind event. And insurance companies are notorious for not wanting to pay for fire, for smoke damage, remediation. Um, so I think people are going to just really have a, a lot of difficulty getting what they're owed. I mean, from recollection, the the average number of arrivals on Maui prior to what happened in, in early August is typically around 7,000 a day, 7,000 people arriving a day. And needless to say, the economy of Maui is and has been for a long time heavily dependent upon visitors coming, visitors staying, visitors spending money. Yeah. And I don't know what the actual numbers are as of today or this week, but uh, my recollection is that you know soon after the the fires, uh, obviously those numbers went way down. So let's let's just say that there's still around two or three thousand. Uh, a day, if that much, compared to seven thousand. 
So, I mean, the, the, the economic um, hit on the island is, is really substantial and it's going to be catastrophic. It's catastrophic, yeah, especially in areas of West Maui. And yeah. there's, there's a real tension between those who are saying, hey, we need to attract tourists. We don't want them tromping around the Lahaina area, but there are parts of West Maui which are now deemed open. And plenty of locals, both Native Hawaiians and non-Native Hawaiians, who believe that uh, this is not the time to wide open have tourists uh, cruising around and taking selfies and taking photos anywhere near the uh, the disaster area. I'm wondering uh, what kind of comment or observation you have about that that tension, and uh, you know uh, how can it. Uh, is it possible to resolve it? I mean, it seems two two kind of opposing forces here where you have folks who say this is a chance for us to reset the economy mm -hmm. of the island away from tourism and others who are laying people off, closing businesses day by day. So uh, what's your take on that? I, I, yeah, I saw this a bit with uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands and in Florida after Hurricane Ian and it. I, I think, I don't know if it'll be a shift in how Maui, you know, sees itself and its economy. And if, if, if maybe it's, it's a turning point, I know many residents told me that they hope it is in terms of being a lot less reliant on tourism. But the truth is like this, this recovery is going to cost a lot of money. And like, where is that, where is that money going to, to come from? So in, in terms of like revol resolving the, the tension, I mean, maybe the, the dream would be there is some partnership among the other islands where they're able to like coordinate a better tourism strategy and share those profits and those, those resources to just help Maui out and being sensitive to people who are still struggling. But also the, a part of the recovery is like people want to be able to move forward and just get back to a routine and like a job and something that's familiar and that is i think to some people tourism and having visitors come and they can just focus on something else instead of the the trauma that that, that they are seeing and it, it it that that does bring some sense of um healing in a, in a way so i mean it's difficult i don't think you resolve it i mean you can't please every every person and every person's um, you know, especially those who are Native Hawaiians, their experience is very different than than other people's. So, I think just trying to be sen as sensitive as as possible, um, with also the understanding that Maui has to move forward, and yeah. and what does moving forward look like? And just kind of one interesting little data point. I know a fellow by the name of Garrett Marrero. Garrett is the owner of Maui Brewing. Mm. Uh, he's been remarkably successful, very successful over the years, and in developing a brand, a very popular brand. And he built a whole new facility uh, in Kihei on the uh, the mountain side of the highway there. And very impressive, a huge solar electric system, which of course brings a smile to my face. And, uh, you know, it's a destination for both uh, umpteen time, umpteen different kinds of beer and ale and also good food. So, mm -hmm. you know, Garrett and his team and his wife have just done a fantastic job. And he was quoted not too long ago as saying that he's down to making uh, what he used to make in a day as far as revenue. He, he's lucky if he makes it in a week. So, I mean, that's that's, yeah. that's off the cliff, right? So, oh, yeah. Know. I mean, they, they it'll take a year for them to make even probably 30, 20, 30 percent, I would say, of, of what they were make it i mean even after ian they erected these tents and these food trucks and they were trying to get tourists to come and it was just like a bizarre feeling where there's these mounds of 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 homes and, and rubble and um you know they're still finding bodies in the mangroves and people are walking around the the beach and and trying to also have some type of joy and lightness there but i i think that honestly like that's the post-disaster world that's what it looks like. And you just have, you don't have to, but like, it's helpful to get used to that, right? That like both things can be true where you can have some business and serve others while also there's, there's still a lot of trauma there and you just have to get hopefully used to there being both. Yeah. What, what better way to help a little bit with, you know, 
cold local crafted brews and i of course right. wish, you know, garrett yeah. garrett and his team the best but let's let's move to the i word you mentioned insurance earlier and you've been mm -hmm. doing quite a bit of reading from different angles over the months on it insurance and that of course is like you referenced a little while ago is is huge you know as far as when the insurance companies pay and when they choose not to pay so let, let's kind of start from the the broad fifty thousand foot level and, and go down to specifics so what what's your kind of overall take on uh where the insurance companies are these days regarding covering uh this growing number of, of disasters and obviously you know a growing amount of money that they're having to pay out, which implies that if they stay in business, right, that they've got to charge their customers more money because they can't, they can't, that they, they have to make adjustments, so to speak. So what's your kind of yeah. overall take on that? Uh, God, insurance is so complicated and there's a lot of it that's so murky and not transparent that we don't really get to see or, or understand. There's like the whole reinsurance aspect that is really driving insurance companies, um, you know, behind the scenes, places like California, Florida, Louisiana, their premiums are, are well, California has been a bit better, but, uh, you know, Florida, Louisiana, Texas, other places in the U.S., their premiums have been skyrocketing because insurance companies are I don't know, it, there's arguments that they were undercharging, that people were underinsured and then also like underpaying for their insurance because like that was the affordable way they could just you know that's how insurance companies were making money is selling all these policies that the normal person could could buy and and then and might not really need to use them and then all of a sudden they all need to use them and it's the insurance company's like oh shit like we don't really have this this much money or we don't really want to pay for it um so then they have to start increasing rates and at the same time, there's all these places that are really risky to live in, and it is should be costing more to live there. So what the equilibrium is, I think we're still figuring out, like, you know, the insurance company is the second most powerful um, industry in lobbying in the, the U.S. Um, so are they like they're not really wanting for for money. They have a lot of influence and, and power and you know, at the same time, they insure and they fund and they back a lot of fossil fuel and, and oil projects that the government, I think, has, you know, been, been investigating that and what that looks like. And then how, like, what is fair for the consumer to pay? Um, I think we're going to really see it get a, a lot more drilled down. Maybe the, the hope would be kind of like neighborhood by neighborhood, parcel by parcel. I think like we have the technology and the data to, to do that. It just in, in terms of like regulations and uh, transparency and how much insurance companies like want to work with states that that might become more of a reality. Well, and interestingly, you know, on my very own island here, not many miles, not that many miles away from where I am right now in, uh, in the Puna district, as we call it. Uh, an insurance company there, the name escapes me. I mean, they essentially canceled the policies of, uh, I believe it's in the hundreds, hundreds of homeowners yeah. there. And uh, these are people who have been paying their bills on time, right, for years. And the the prospects of getting insured with another company is likely going to meet a substantial increase. And the, the per capita income in this part of the island is, is, is on the low side. So, I mean, these are real people in real homes who are really suffering. And that kind of brings to mind this piece that you did we're focused on Florida on this one particular gentleman and his family who uh, said, hey, I, I paid my bill on time uh, all, all this time. And I was devastated by, um, was it hurricane? And, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're not paying me. So uh, what can you tell me about that particular story, which I think is so poignant? Yeah, I mean, I heard that from dozens of people. And I think we're going to see a lot more people across the U.S., especially in high risk states just choose to go without insurance and risk losing everything because they can't afford to do the other option, which is just really sad. And I was getting that a lot in Florida that these companies, again, that should have had enough in the, in the bank, it's very complicated and situational, but yes, that these people were paying their premiums. And then when they need to be covered in full, the company doesn't do it in the way that they the resident thinks they should, and then it's the company's word against 
a single person forcing them to get litigation, which a lot of other people can't afford. So yeah, a lot of people are just forced to give up and um, accept what they're given, which is not a lot. Um, at least that was in Florida. And I know that's been happening in Louisiana as well. And if the insurance company goes out of business after you've been paying your premiums on time for years, if not decades, I mean, what kind of recourse does an individual have who suffered major damage from a, a natural event? It depends on the state. Depends on the state. But yes, usually in Florida, where I'm familiar with, you know, they'll get what they, you know, attorneys and I, consumer advocates say is pennies on the dollar. It takes a lot longer for them to get this money. The state has to take over. Um, you know, they come in using taxpayer resources. And yeah, what happens to the executives, right? <laughs> it's like the, that's the big question. What do they walk away with? Uh, you wrote a piece a number of months ago that caught my attention as far as the insurance companies uh, donating or providing money to the fossil fuel industry. I thought mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting because, uh, you know, one could claim that uh, it's the, uh, the the consumption and the burning of hydrocarbons in, at the present time and also in the past that has led to climate change and these superstorms and so forth. Uh, what, what can you tell me about that particular piece, which I thought was really interesting? Yeah, that was interesting for, for me, too. It was kind of my first dive into that. And like, as I said earlier, the, the government has, uh, I think it tapped like six or seven of the top insurance in the country for more information on the uh, billions that they have been pouring into that industry and also what their policy, you know, if they're going against their own policies on preventing climate change or being, you know, trying to support that industry less. And I mean, that's the that's just the amazing part of the this industry is that they pay this like billions of dollars to support fossil fuels, yet they're pulling out of states because climate change is making it too expensive to insure there or pulling back in states too. And uh, kind of before you leave, leave the insurance topic, uh, what's happening in California? Uh, they're, they're trying to, there's some type of reforms going on that would affect the industry, hopefully to the betterment of the, the, the citizens of California. Um, yeah, California is now working with the insurance industry a little more, actually, because we had some of the kind of like tighter, tightest regulations, and we had far below average premiums here for how much risk um, that is in areas of the, the state in terms of fire flooding. So uh, California uh, insurance department decided to work with the insurance industry a little bit and we're, and is letting them use uh, like catastrophe modeling, which is very common in the industry. The reason why California didn't want them using it in the past is because it's this very complicated data, usually run by third parties. So there's not a ton of transparency. So uh, they could come out with a catastrophe model saying, oh, you know, this part of the state we're projecting could be at risk for these types of fires. So we're going to charge people there like 30% more. And politicians are like, what? Like, we don't understand. What, what are you looking at? Like, we don't have access to that. It's private. So California was really re hesitant to do that. But in the same time, insurance industry co or companies were then having to look at 15-year-old data to make their projections. So that's one big thing. Um, and that they are going to be a bit faster and uh, yeah, faster at, at passing industry rate increases. So actually consumer advocates here, were not really that pleased with the new reforms, so. Well, as we wind down here, is there any question that you would like me to ask you or anything else you'd like to bring up or talk about in your, in your reporting, whether it's Hawaii based or insurance or anything else for that matter, uh, that uh, before we wrap it up? Uh, I mean, I really hope to get be getting back to Maui soon. I, I think we, I have a colleague who's amazing. Uh, his name is Reese. I think he's going back this month to just continue doing coverage. He's very interested in the land ownership aspect and who is buying land if, if that's happening. And uh, that we're just really, you know, I, I've gotten pulled off Maui in some ways because I've also been doing a lot of Hurricane Ian reporting, but my the part I love about my job is I get to go back to disasters when a lot of reporters don't. 
So I plan on being back there in the, the new year and really just keeping it in the news. So if anyone wants to reach out, um, you know, email is, is pretty easy to find. And yeah, that's, I think that's all I kind of have to add. I think that's a great idea. And especially, you know, as we're moving past the so-called acute period of the disaster and, you know, the national attention and the lights and the reporters kind of go to the, the next story. And the money winds down, you know, the emergency funds to put homeless people in hotels for weeks mm -hmm. or months at a time. I mean, inevitably, there will be, I, uh, sadly, there will be more people who will be homeless uh, yes. because their money will have run out or the hotel will have, uh, you know how that goes. So, I mean, it's, yes. uh, it's we're in for the long haul here as far as the suffering goes, sadly. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Brianna. This has been uh, a great time we've had together and i do hope that we can uh, reconvene at some point you know more interesting juicy stuff to talk about so uh, mahalo nui